Let's get into our scripture lesson for this morning. We'll be in the gospel according to Matthew, the first chapter. We're going to read verses 17 through 25. Hear the words of the gospel for us this morning. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took Mary as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had born a son, and he named him Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we say, Amen. thanks be to God. Amen. Would you bow your heads in a word of prayer with me? Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this morning, this time together, for your word and the scriptures. As these words are about to be spoken, we pray that you would break open our hearts and our ears that we might receive them. We pray that the Holy Spirit might change them into the words that you need for us to hear. So that we might become your hands and your feet. Disciples of your son. And workers of the field. And we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So this morning we are starting a brand new series. The Jesus I Never Knew. We're looking at Jesus and some points about him that are sometimes either overlooked or by a lot of time a lot of times downgraded because they don't seem as important as some of the other things, like the salvation that he gives and death and resurrection. You know, they're the big the big things, right? But the fact is that as disciples of Christ, we have taken on the task of becoming his ambassadors to this world. We have pledged, when you came up and joined the church, when you came up and made your profession of faith, whether it was here or at, your, or at another church or another denomination or wherever, when you first gave your heart to Christ, your statement, your pledge at that point was that you were going to try to be like Christ in every single way. That you would live your life to the point where someone would see Christ in you. In the first century, the word disciple was something important. And it's really interesting that we as a church have continued to keep that one word there's a number of things that we've kept, but that's one of the biggest things that we've kept from that first century understanding. The word disciple meant a person who followed a rabbi. In the first century, a, a, the, the, the men of the village would go to school at the synagogue, at the temple. That was where education happened, was inside the church. And after they had gone through all of their education, which weeded out a lot of the kids... When they finished, when they graduated, as it were, the best of the best of the best the rabbis would come to and would call them to be their disciples. 
Now, each rabbi, of course, had a different wording that they said when they called someone. Jesus himself, when he calls the disciples, we know, I will make you fishers of men, and so on. And so, I mean, there's lots of different ways in which they said, I want you to be my disciple. But at the end of the day, all of those different ways of talking about it actually equated into one easy-to-understand statement. And that was that the rabbi was coming to this young man and saying, I believe that you can do what I do. I believe you can do what I do. I think it's no coincidence that Jesus did not, nor the fir- did the first converts of the faith, change the vernacular of the people that followed Christ to followers or to believers. or anything. They kept the word disciple because they wanted people that were disciples, not just followers, not just people who liked Jesus, but they were disciples who were going to follow Christ so closely that they would work so hard to emulate who He was in every aspect of their lives. And it's also a disciple because Jesus calls us, right? Just like He called Peter and James and John and all the rest, He calls us the same way. To be in ministry, to be wherever we're supposed to be, to do whatever we're supposed to do. And in every time He calls us, He says the same thing. I believe that you can do what I do. I believe you can do what I did. Why do you think when Jesus talks to the disciples, remember he, said, he tells the disciples that after He's gone, even greater things will happen. I believe that His reasoning for behind that was the fact that not only will people grow closer and closer to Him, in which case they will receive the amount of power that He has through the Holy Spirit, but there will be truckloads more people that are able to do it as they continue to get closer and closer. In the stories of the Gospel, we see what a disciple really looks like. One of the best examples is Peter, who walked on water. Not the miracle of healing anyone, right? But it's important to know that story, not because it's just incredible to think of someone walking on the top of the water, but because the reason why Peter jumped out of the boat in the first place was because all he saw was his rabbi walking on the water and his first thought is, he told me I could do what he does. I want to do what he's doing and he's walking on the water. So I'm going to walk on the water. He is my rabbi and I want to do everything that he does. Now, I say all of this and give all this background to talk about the fact that the biggest part of a disciple's life, whether it be first century or now, was that a disciple was meant to learn everything they could about their rabbi. Nothing was too personal. Nothing was too small of a detail for them to know about their rabbi. In the first century, there were blessings. Rabbis did exactly what Jesus did. Wander from town to town to town to town to town, giving blessings. Some of them were miracle workers. They did do healings. They would preach. They would teach. They would talk to people. They would live in the town for a period. They would travel along. The disciples would follow along behind them, just like Jesus did with the twelve. And there was a blessing that would go from the local people of the town, when they saw the disciples, when the rabbi was leaving town and going somewhere else, then the blessing that they would give to the disciples is, may you be caked in the dust of your rabbi. May you be so close to him that whatever he steps in is caked on your front. May you know him so well that there is no difference between the two of you. Now, there is a break here, of course. While the disciples of the first century were trying to follow and emulate their rabbi for the idea that they would one day take and fill the shoes of their rabbi because they were human, they would die, and someone would need to take their place. Our rabbi ain't dying. (laughs) 
So we're not trying to take Jesus' place, but at the same time, we're still the disciples. We're still trying to get as close as we can to our rabbi, close as we can to our Savior, and to learn every detail about him that we possibly can. And so this sermon series is meant to arouse that curiosity and shine light on areas of Jesus' life and ministry that you may never have given thought to. And maybe these points are things that might help when you go out into the world and be the ambassador that you're supposed to be. So today we're going to start with something that seems like a no-brainer. But unfortunately, lots of people don't quite catch it. It's the first note in your sermon notes this morning. Jesus was Jewish, not Christian. I know it sounds very silly to say it, all right? But I can guarantee you that most of y'all can think of at least one person who would have a problem with that statement. I know I've seen them. So let's get the obvious thing out of the way. A Christian, by definition, is someone who follows Christ. So how does Christ follow himself? Christ cannot be a Christian. He was Jewish. From the very beginning, he was Jewish. He was born Jewish. He was raised Jewish. He lived the Jewish life. That's who he was. Now, the first question that you should ask about all these things, and as I said, these are, these are little-known points or sub-points, because, of course, the big points is he died on a cross, he raised from the dead. I mean, big things. We know those stories. Why are we focusing on something as seems trivial as the fact that Jesus was Jewish? Well, at first, for me, I have to go back to the Scriptures to prove why this is even important. The book of Matthew is chock full of purposeful statements making sure that we know that the Messiah, that Jesus is of the line of Judah. That is, he is Jewish at his very core. He is Jewish. We could have read the entirety of the beginning of the book of Matthew, all, what is it, that 21 generations of names? <laughs> I don't, it, 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 honestly, you, you're, you're probably better reading Leviticus than reading that. <laughs> it's boring, and it's incredibly difficult to try and put all of those names together. But why does Matthew think that this is so imp, uh, of such great importance that he spends a page and a half listing out names of people? When he could have easily just said, he's related to Abraham, he's related to David, he's related to Solomon, and he's related to these big names. But instead he lists every single name. Matthew wants to make sure that we know that Jesus, his Jewishness is important. He clearly thought that it was so important that everyone know that Jesus was Jewish. We, we even get into the point in the, story, in the passage that we read this morning. References the prophet concerning Jesus' birth. This isn't just to prove that the prophecies came true, but that Jesus was the one that was fulfilling them. This is a prophecy that has an end. The end is virgin birth. It happened. Now, the question then, if, if we can understand and, and accept the fact that it is important, uh, clearly it was important to the gospel writer of Matthew, it's important to the, pe the, the other gospels, because the other gospels talk about the prophecies and all that kind of stuff. They focus back on the Old Testament numerous times. So the question then becomes, well, if it's so important, then why is it important? Why is, and, and more importantly, why is it important to us in 2023? We can understand at least a little bit that it might have been very important to the first generation of Christians who most likely were Jewish themselves to have some kind of camaraderie with Jesus. But in 2023, most converts aren't coming from the Jewish faith. 
So why is it important that we know all of this? Why, is the, why are those passages important? And to that I go all the way back to Abraham himself. The book of Genesis, chapter 12, verses 2 and 3 are the first covenant that he makes with Abraham. It says, I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And here is the important piece. In you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. In you all all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now remember what we said last week about that word blessing. It's not meaning that you're going to get the treasured goats. It doesn't mean that you're going to get all the land or anything else. It means that God will come near to you. God's promise to Abraham is not that the Jewish people, the chosen people of God, will have be blessed through Abraham, but that all the earth will be blessed through Him. Salvation comes, and I, some of y'all may have heard this, it's not technically biblical in the sense that you're not going to find the quote anywhere in the Scriptures, but the understanding is there. Salvation comes through from the Jews. And it comes from understanding this passage of the, prop, of, the, of the promise from God. It comes from the epistles where Paul talks about it a lot of times as well. It comes from the understanding of reading that beginning of Matthew where we have the genealogy of the Jewish faith of why Jesus is Jewish, making sure that everyone knows that he's part of that lineage all the way to David and all the way to Abraham. That salvation for the world comes from the Jewish people. It starts there with Abraham. The promise to Abraham and the fulfillment of the promise in Christ. So it's important. We can understand that it's not only important, but why it's important that Jesus was Jewish and that we know that He was Jewish. But the next question for us is, what does that matter to us? when we're going into the world and trying to evangelize or trying to be ambassadors for Christ, I told you that disciples, the whole point was to know your rabbi the best that you can. Why is this small detail, why is this piece so important? Why is this nugget of biographical information important to our understanding? And I think a big piece is it helps us to understand and read the rest of the Gospel accounts. Because the next note in your sermon notes is something that is difficult for us to put together. But in the first century, we have to understand, not all Jews hated Jesus. As a matter of fact, most didn't. I think one of the most important and powerful things that we need to remember when we read the Scriptures is that Jesus was a Jewish rabbi speaking to Jewish men and women on the field, going from town to town, teaching them how to live the best Jewish life that they could. So many times in sermons, Bible studies, even random conversations out in the parking lot or in the hallways after those Sunday school lessons and Bible studies and sermons, we tend to lump all of the Jews of the first century into this one category. We lump them into the same camp with the religious elite. Those that didn't really like Jesus. Those that tried to undermine Jesus. Those that tried to trap Jesus. Those that eventually would put him up for, tri for a fake trial. Those that would con uh, eventually send him to Pontius Pilate for, mur for, for death, murder, whatever you want to call it. And would eventually get him onto the cross. We lump all of them into that one category, but the fact of the matter is, that's just not how it worked. There were layers of people that surrounded Jesus throughout His entire ministry, with almost all of them exclusively being Jewish. Because that's where He was. I mean, He's living, breathing, walking, doing all of His ministry in Israel. Minus the Romans that happen to be around, there's not many others. 
But theologians and historians have come to agreement about the fact that there were circles of influence surrounding Jesus. Different levels of people that wandered and came to Christ. I want to talk about those for a second because I think it's important for us to understand it. I'm going to start at the very, very top. We've got Jesus, of course, right in dead center. Right around him was his inner circle. There were three. Peter, James, and John. We see that in the Scriptures, right? Peter, James, and John, those are the three that are up on the mountainside for the transfiguration, right? In the Garden of Gethsemane, what disciples get close enough to Jesus after he leaves the twelve to go pray? It's Peter, James, and John who are close enough to him. Those three are the inner circle, the higher ups of the twelve. Then, of course, we go to the next level and we have the twelve, right? We've got the twelve disciples and we know them. All of them, including Judas, right? Each one of them verbally called. We have their call stories written down in the Scriptures. We know that they followed Jesus every step of the way. They heard every sermon. They saw every miracle. They camped with Him at night. They woke up with Him in the morning. They walked, listened, and watched every second of those three years of ministry. That's the twelve. Then we get to a bigger circle. We have the seventy. Now this comes from the Scripture text where Jesus sends out people to be in ministry to the surrounding villages. Remember, he doesn't. He, in, in, twice in the Scriptures he does this. He sends out the twelve in one Scripture, but in another Scripture he sends out a much larger group of people. And these groups of this group of people are the people who were willing to follow Jesus to places of working and serving. In other words, they were willing to put their faith and their belief in Jesus into practice, into action. Some of the people in this group we do know. Mary, Martha, Lazarus. People of that stature that they may not have been part of the twelve. They may not have seen every second of Jesus' ministry, but they got as close as they could. The next group, this is where we get into vague numbers. All right? this is, so, so the next group is called the 5,000. It doesn't necessarily mean that we think it was just 5,000 people. But it's the idea that these are the people, it comes from the story of the feeding. right? Feed the 5,000 people. This is a group of people, the, the group of people around Jesus that follow Jesus to places of feeding and healing. These are the people that Jesus has had physical contact with, either through actual physical contact or a healing procedure. Rather, it was they were part of the 3,000 or 5,000 that were fed on those mountainsides, or, he, or they were part of the groups that were healed by Jesus. These are the people that did more than merely observe and evaluate Jesus. They were touched and helped by Him. It was this group that followed Him into the desert, desperate not to miss even one of His miraculous works of healing or provision. Then finally we have the most furthest out. We call these the crowds. These are the people that would just show up when Jesus was close to come hear Him speak, to come watch what He did. These were people that were willing to come to see Jesus in a place of watching and listening. They weren't going to make long, long journeys. They weren't going to take time necessarily far out of their day. But they might take a day out of work to go listen to Jesus when He was on the outskirts of their town. It was probably the least amount of commitment. But the fact is, is that that's still a vast number of people. Now, when you think about all of those people, that's a lot. That's a lot of Jewish people in the first century around Jesus' time of ministry that were willing to spend their time, their energy, and give of themselves to come, at the very least, listen to Him. Who truly desired to hear what He had to say. 
And yet, when we talk about the Jewish people in the New Testament, who are the people that we first come to mind? Caiaphas? Judas? It's important to remember that Jesus was a Jewish rabbi talking to other Jews about the kingdom that would eventually encapsulate the entire world. It's important for us to read the story of the, Old, of the New Testament knowing that Jesus loved every single person that He came into contact with. That He died for every last one of them. And that when we read the stories, we need to understand that the people that He's talking to, minus those select few in the religious elite that really did want it out for Him, the rest of them were listening with a desire to be better than they were before. With a desire to truly understand and know what Jesus was trying to teach them. Now the final thing that I want you to know about Jesus and His Jewishness and why it's important is the last note in your sermon notes this morning. That is, Jesus came to uphold, not to abolish. Again, I'm going to go into Matthew's Gospel. 5th chapter 17. It says, Do not, uh, Jesus, this is Jesus' words to the crowd. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. In the church today, most people know a lot of information about that much of the Scriptures. But all of that is very foreign. Because it's the Old Testament. If Jesus wasn't Jewish, if he didn't, if he came to finish, then the Old Testament is nothing but a history book. A very important, a very powerful one, a very theatrical one. In some instances, a very fun one to read. But we know that the entire thing is the important piece. The Old Testament has to, become, it has to be important. If Jesus didn't come to uphold and live the Jewish way of life, then the Old Testament doesn't how hold any water anymore. It doesn't mean anything anymore. It's washed away by the baptismal waters. And all we need to learn and to know and to live by is the New Testament, the Gospels and the Epistles. But the Old Testament is a powerful part of the Scriptures. It's equal to the power and the authority of the New Testament. In other words, if it weren't, why would we keep it all together? His Jewish nature was a powerful part of who he was. It speaks to how he conducted himself when he walked from village to village. How he spoke, how he was seen by his peers and the people that listened to him and should inform how we read his words and deeds when we read the Scriptures. Because the fact of the matter is that if Jesus came to uphold, not to abolish... then that means the Old Testament is important. Just as important as reading John 3.16. Just as important as reading the, Roman, the letter to the Romans. Just as important as reading the book of Revelation. That you should know the book of Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Genesis and Exodus just as well as you know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The Old Testament was not made obsolete by Christ or rendered less than the Gospel accounts. They were upheld and solidified and the promise of God was upheld by the exact kind of man that Christ was. Of all the things that Matthew shows us in those first chapters, I point back to what we read this morning. 
the prophecy of Jesus' birth by virgin. Why is that so important? Because it's a prophecy that's been fulfilled. It's a promise of God to the prophet Elisha that this was going to happen in order for the Messiah to come into the world. It's finished. What's another promise that God makes? That salvation will come to all people through the Jewish, people, the Jewish faith. The problem with that second promise is that it hasn't finished yet. I don't know about how uh, many of y'all, but I know that there are days when I get up in the morning and I think, if I were to be at the gates right now, would Jesus really welcome me in? Or would He look at me and say, I never knew you. I don't say that to mean that I look down on myself, but I know myself. And there are days that I think that maybe my sin is just a little more than he can stomach. But those things are there because I don't know the end of the story. I have hope. I have faith. I have belief. But I can't know. Not until I'm there. And so this promise is unfulfilled only because we haven't gotten to the end yet. How do we make sure that we continue to have the faith that it's going to be prom that the promise is still going to be fulfilled in the way that we hope it will be fulfilled? By looking to all the other prophecies and all the other promises that have already been made and fulfilled. And say, if he did all of that, I can have faith that he'll do this one. I have the proof right here. And it starts in the Old Testament with God's words and His promises. And it finishes, is fulfilled in the New Testament through the Jewish rabbi whose name is Jesus Christ. And is fulfilled because He was a Jewish rabbi from Galilee. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, our heartfelt desire is to be the best disciples we can be. To know our rabbi better than we know ourselves. To know every aspect of him. So that when we say we want to be like Christ, we can be like Christ. Help us to not overlook things. Help us to not see them as small details, but important details. And help us to see our rabbi in new light every single day. So that as we walk and as we follow, we are covered in the dust of our Savior, our Master, our Messiah, our Rabbi, who has called to us and said, I believe you can do what I do. We pray all this in Christ's precious name. Amen.